NCR Corporation is a leader in omnichannel solutions, turning everyday interactions with businesses into exceptional experiences. With its software, hardware, and portfolio of services, NCR enables nearly 700 million transactions daily across financial, retail, hospitality, travel, telecom, and technology industries. NCR solutions run the everyday transactions that make your life easier. NCR is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 30,000 employees and does business in 180 countries. Thank you all for uh, waking up today and deciding to come and hear someone talk about insect eating uh, and actually in encourage you to do some insect eating. And uh, in addition to thanking you all for being here today, I want to thank the organizers of this event uh, for being wise enough to put Bill before me because he touched on a lot of stuff that I'm basically going to drill down on a little bit more specifically because I'm going to talk about eating insects. So the, the thing that I don't have any images of is something that is alluded to in the title of the talk, which is the schoolyard. A lot of people have asked me, well, when did you start eating insects? Well, my, my first time doing it was kind of, um, well, let's say it wasn't a shining moment for me. I was seven years old. It was recess. We were on the playground, and some of my friends dared me to eat a fire ant. They sting. And uh, if you're going to go ahead and eat a stinging insect, I'll just tell you now, chew fast and right away. Otherwise, guess what happens? So I got my tongue stung, and then I ate the bug, because I wasn't going to lose the bed. And, and, and then I didn't eat bugs for a long time. And what ended up happening was uh, I've been with the same company for 25 years. And in 1997, the director of our nature center, one of the facilities we operate in New Orleans is a nature center, they, she called me and she said, hey, we're going to do an edible insect event. And I said, great. And then there was this pregnant pause on the phone. And I said, and? And she said, well, you're the bug guy. I said, yeah, right. That's not the same as being a bug chef. I was nonetheless summarily charged with figuring it out. Uh, and I will tell you that at that time, there were two out of print insect cookbooks and two websites with about seven recipes on them. So we were definitely sort of going into what was, at least for me, uncharted territory, for most of us uncharted territory. But it worked out well. In fact, it worked out uh, really well. But at the start, um, well, let's just say the reason I have this slide here is to say that my talk didn't necessarily need to be called from the schoolyard to Singapore. It could have been called from being stupid to being sloppy to being stylish. Because at first, I really didn't have a good feel for presentation of food, presentation of myself uh, as, a, as a chef. And by the way, I don't have a day of culinary training under my belt, so don't let the title fool you. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is a picture of me from about one month into my bug cooking career uh, on the right. And then, and then me at work a little bit later. So what ended up happening, in addition to doing a lot of things in New Orleans, uh, because I like the sound of my own voice, I guess, people would call me and say, we're doing an insect festival, and we want you to come cook bugs, and we're doing an insect event, and we want to do like an iron chef with you against a, a local restaurateur. Now, this is a little bit intimidating, because these, these other guys, they, they really know what they're doing, and they're putting out these very elegant and beautiful plates of food that happen to have insects in them. And we're getting folks from the audience to test and vote on them, and it, it's really been a lot of fun. I don't know if you guys are familiar with an old show called The Iron Chef, but uh, the bug geek joke is we called it the chitin chef. Does anybody get that joke? I have a few of you. Yeah, the exoskeleton of an insect is made out of a complex polysaccharide called chitin. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, if you're a bug nerd, you got to have bug nerd jokes. That's the way it goes. So in any case, uh, this is just a, a, a set of events outside of New Orleans that I've been able to do over the years, ranging from farmer's markets to things at museums. Um, I, I went ahead and included a picture of me with a trophy because I, I do usually come out on top when I'm doing these bug cooking contests, kind of a nice little point of pride. But uh, you might recognize uh, at least one famous person here. If any of you ever watched a Disney show called The Sweet Life with Zach and Cody, yeah, that's that little dude. He's a, he was on stage cooking with me in Los Angeles as like a celebrity guest. And then on the top, if, any, if anyone ever watches Spon SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, the voice of Sandy the Squirrel is that woman in the orange shirt uh, in that top picture. So it's been a lot of fun. I, and and uh, uh, the, 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 the biggest thing that happened, which uh, Amelia said when she introduced me, was there was a newspaper article about this first edible insect event we did in 1997. And three months later, I get a call to be on The Tonight Show. 
And I mean, I was, I was not really prepared for it, but I, I think it went OK. Uh, and so it's one of those things you get a lot of mileage out of doing national TV. You know, People introduce you as a bug chef, even though that's about 10% of what I do with my time. Um, but it was a pretty big deal. And ultimately, I got to go to Singapore and cook bugs. Now, there's a little funny story here that uh, is not uh, directly about me encouraging you guys to eat insects. Uh, in fact, it sort of ended up being, in a, in a fashion, the opposite. The Singaporean government likes to have periodic cultural appreciation events so that the population of Singapore, which is made from expatriates from many other countries, all get along well. Why they flew a person from the United States over to Singapore to do bug cooking, I don't know, because geographically, they're around a lot of countries where a lot of people eat bugs. But there I was on their nickel getting to fly across the world, and they had this great setup, and I brought all of my own insects, I had them preserved in olive oil, I brought my own cookware, I brought everything, and this was on my table. So I flew across the globe to tell people, you can eat bugs, here's how to do it, I'm going to cook some dishes. Hope you like that, bye. They didn't even get to try any of it which is pretty sad, and you know, lucky for you, some of y'all will get to actually try some bugs when I'm done talking, which makes a lot more sense, don't you think? Yeah. So, there are some basic questions that have to be answered when you talk to folks about eating insects. And the first one is, who eats bugs? Well, the answer is about two billion people on the planet, about a third of the population, incorporates insects into their diet, at least sometime, if not as a major component of what they eat uh, during the course of their lives. So these are photographs of some leafcutter ants from Colombia. Uh, one of these corners has a, a melange of different insects from Southeast Asia, including giant water bugs. That's on the top in one corner. Another corner is a, a wichity grub, which is a, a type of caterpillar uh, that's uh, dug up uh, by Aboriginal people in Australia and eaten, and, and then the bottom two corners are uh, some insects from Africa. So the fact of the matter is that in the developing world where people cannot mass rear livestock and poultry, a lot of their protein needs are met by insects. In many cases, these are insects that are foraged and you find them being sold in open markets. And sometimes people just buy a bundle of them and they bring them to their houses or they eat them right there uh, in the market. A quick note about foraging, because I know I'm gonna forget it l a little bit later when I, when I talk more about foraging, is that if you decide you wanna go out and catch your own bugs, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is try to avoid an urban environment because we put a lot of pollutants not pesticides necessarily, because if you find a bug that's actively crawling or flying, it's probably not full of insecticide. It's healthy. But it could have lead or other contaminants on it. So if you catch bugs to eat, do it in an undeveloped area. Go to a forest, a field, a swamp, a desert, uh, and that way you have a little less to worry about. Uh, the second thing is, think about what we call optimal foraging theory. Basically, Calories in have to be more than calories out, or it's not worth your while. So you want to find bugs that are large, slow, abundant, or that aggregate in big groups. If I asked you to go out and find dragonflies in Washington, D.C. in December, we all know that's a losing bet, right? They're not out there. They're too fast anyway. It's cold. So think about that when you go out and look for some bugs. In any case, in sub-Saharan Africa, this animal is called a Mopani worm. It's a type of caterpillar. And uh, the reason I include this slide is not because, I'll be honest with you, the caterpillars look kind of unappetizing in the lower corner there when they're cooked, but it's really to show you how beautiful the caterpillar is when it's alive. I like to use entomophagy, insect eating, for two things. To expand your horizons, to make you think more about the foods that are out there that you can, in fact, eat, because we eat a very narrow range of things that are actually edible but also to get you excited about entomology in general, because I think insects are the little things that run the planet. Our terrestrial ecosystems would fall apart if insects weren't aerating soil, decomposing and re recycling nutrients, if they weren't food for other animals and eating a lot of stuff themselves, balancing all of these food webs and food pyramids, and if they weren't pollinating plants. So we need to care about insects in the first place because they're integral to our survival, and they're also just cool as heck. So, you know, there's one pretty caterpillar to illustrate the point. This is a significant enough thing, this business of eating insects, that in 2013, the United Nations published a document, 150 pages, basically advocating entomophagy for all of the world, not just the developing world. 
uh, I think Bill, who spoke to you all uh, previously, talked about uh, things that are ecologically significant and that make a big impact. And I'll just take a moment to give you a, just, just a little bit of uh, a basis, to, and you can research from here. If you raise cattle, the volume of plant material and water it takes to go from a cow to a pound of edible beef on the table is about 10 to 50 times higher than the amount of plant material and water it takes to get the same pound of cricket to the table. So if we're looking at how we use land and how we use what we grow to feed the things that we eat, doing it with insects, farming insects, is a lot more efficient and it's better ecologically on a large scale. So getting back to the question of who eats bugs, well, <laughs> you do. You already do, whether you know it or not. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has allowable bugs and bug parts in all sorts of stuff that we eat all the time. Ketchup, peanut butter, chocolate, and of course, all sorts of produce. Well, this means a couple of things. One is it means it's impossible to keep bugs out of your food. But the other is it means that it's not bad to eat bugs in the first place. And so when I'm pitching this whole business of eating insects to folks, I like to say, well, you've already done it by accident. Why not do it with purpose and seasonings? So the nutritional component here is one that a lot of people wonder about. There was a Mexican researcher, I believe she's retired now, named Julieta Ramos Elodori, and she wrote a book called Creepy Crawly Cuisine. And she was uh, on the forefront of actually assaying, testing in a lab, different kinds of insects for their nutritional content. Many insects do have a lot of protein in them. The, the percent of their body, the dry weight of which is protein, is very, very high. But just as chicken and beef and fish don't have the same carbohydrate fat and protein content, there's no reason to expect that a June beetle and an ant and a grasshopper are going to be the same either. So uh, when you look at this chart, what you will see is that things that we like to eat a lot tend to have way more protein per 100 grams than we need. Many of them have a lot more fat than we need, and most of our protein sources end up being devoid of carbohydrate. So nutritionally, you really could do yourself a favor by going to a diet that at least includes bugs if it weren't all bugs. So this is just one little example of that. The other page that I don't have uh, to show you today is that across the board, most of the insects that have been tested have high levels of iron, niacin, riboflavin, phosphorus, and calcium, all of which are things we need to have in our bodies in order to be healthy people. So the good news is that even though culturally where most of us are of European descent, we don't come from and therefore don't have as a mindset, insect eating is what we do. The good news is that in the last, I would say about eight or nine years, there has been a real notable uptick in the acceptance of insect eating here in the United States. Actually, I should pause. Who here has eaten bugs, like intentionally? Hey, there's some cooked bugs, yum, yum, yum. Okay, that's probably like a tenth of you. Okay, good, I just wanted to poll the room real quickly. Um, so uh, I hope you liked them, and uh, we got more. Um, so I, I, put some, I put some text up here to remind me to tell you all that just in the last 10 years in the United States, there have been these startup companies that are making flour based on insects. They're uh, making nutrition bars with insects as a large component, and actually farm-rearing insects specifically for human consumption. So this is, this is certainly gaining acceptance. And in addition to that, there are restaurants, including a couple right here in the D.C. area. Uh, I learned of one just this morning talking to Bill called Oya Mel, which is not on here, where insects are regularly served on the menu. There's a couple in New Orleans where I live, and the reason that I highlighted, and by the way, this is a very short list. There's a lot more restaurants than this uh, around the country that have insects on the menu, but Philadelphia is on there because this place called Tequila's, when I learned about it, somebody said, oh, yeah, it's on Locust Street. I love it. Um, Let's get back to foraging real quickly. There's gonna be two ways that you can acquire bugs if you wanna eat them, and one is to go out and look for them yourself. If you do, another very basic principle to remember is that if an insect is well camouflaged, it's trying to hide, and it's probably trying to hide because it is tasty to insectivores. So birds and lizards and would-be bug-eating people, you know, the insect is trying not to get found by you. So these are good candidates. And like anything, you should sample one, see how it is on the tongue, make sure it doesn't bother your tummy after a few minutes, then take a slightly larger bite, give yourself a half an hour, and if none of that bothers you, you can probably eat it. Now, I'm, I'm saying this as though you just found it and ate it raw. We'll talk about eating things raw in a minute, but typically we cook our food, so keep that in mind. And then, 
There's the stuff that I would steer you away from. Uh, in the biological sciences, warning coloration has a fancy term like everything. It's called aposomatic coloring. And insects that are aposomatically colored tend to show stripes or spots that alternate between black and white and something else very bright, like orange or yellow or red. And when you see insects that are colored like this, they're usually trying to warn predators, hey, if you grab me, one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to sting you, or you're going to throw up if you try to eat me. So if you see bugs like that, I would say, nope. So the second way you can get bugs is to order them. Not only are there these companies that I mentioned a minute ago that are relatively new, but there are about a dozen outfits around the United States where insects are reared by the millions, primarily for the zoo industry and for the pet trade, to feed the insect-eating animals that we keep. However, you can order them, and they'll be at your doorstep 24 to 48 hours later. Usually, they're in some kind of a substrate, some kind of a medium or packaging material that you want to separate them from. And then you may want to do other things to process the bug. In this picture with the colander, I've demonstrated the removal of uh, uh, the legs and the antennae from crickets. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I'll get into that if I have time at the end of my talk, or if somebody remembers to ask me about it. But the point is that when you're done, oh my gosh, you can have chocolate chirp cookies. I, I know, I know, it's hilarious. Thought of it myself. Uh, so this is what we do where I work. Uh, my, the museum where, where I'm a curator has about 23,000 square feet of insect exhibits. And uh, one of the things, again, that Bill alluded to was uh, telling engaging stories. And, and really, I think that uh, if, if we as a museum can't, with our displays and with our personal interaction with our guests, if we can't enchant and enthuse you all about insects and get you to care about and act on behalf of the natural world beyond the walls of our building, we certainly haven't succeeded in what we want to do. We want to educate you. We want to entertain you. But we want it to last. We want it to have a positive effect uh, beyond your visit uh, to the insectarium. So to that end, one of our spaces is called Bug Appetit. Again, we're just so clever. Uh, if you're familiar with the French phrase, bon appetit, which means eat well. So it's a nice little turn of a phrase. And this is what uh, the space looks like. Hold on one second. This is what the space looks like when nobody's around. It's a nice little room. Uh, there's some photographs of insects here and there. And these are the insects that we serve. Uh, the places that I mentioned earlier that rear millions of insects, they are primarily raising house crickets, wax worms, that's what's in the middle there, that's a type of caterpillar, and mealworms, which are a type of beetle larva. We go through 200,000 of them a year. And coincidentally, our visitation is about 200,000 guests a year. So we average a bug in the mouth of every visitor who comes by. Now, unfortunately for me, promoting entomophagy, you know, I know that one person's not eating bugs and another person's having a handful of bugs. But it averages out to 200,000 insects every year. And so here you see some folks around eating. I've got Mac and Erica there getting all ready to, to serve up food for our hoppy Thanksgiving menu. And, um, uh, in uh, the photograph of the nice cake there, that's, uh, that's for our Jingle Bugs event around Christmas time. So as you might have already figured out, it's a fruit fly cake. As opposed to just a fruit cake, right? We're always interested in good little puns like that. Um, and, and you can see Mac and Eric are all ready to serve buffet style. And you know, it's free with your admission. So you can come try some bugs. Uh, before I get into this, I almost forgot to mention when I was showing that nutritional chart, uh, I did want to tell you sort of who's on the forefront of promoting insect eating, trying to figure out nutritional benefits of insects, trying to help people uh, where malnutrition is a problem. And uh, there's a university in Denmark called Wageningen. I, d I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right because I've heard different pronunciations, but there is a whole lab there dedicated uh, with, you know, as a food science just to studying entomophagy. I often get asked, What's your favorite bug to eat? Uh, I have a tripartite answer. As common as they are at insect eating events around the world, I really like house crickets. They are very, very tasty, even when they are relatively plain. I'll stop here and I'll mention that when we serve insects to an audience that might be a little hesitant to expand their gastronomic horizons, we don't normally just show them a bowl of crickets and go, here, eat them. I just put salt on them. We use some other textures and some other flavors to get you over that mental hump if you're a little anxious about the whole process. 
Uh, and then if it tastes good, you might say to yourself, the next time you're presented with a bug that's a little more au natural, you know, not gussied up with a, lot, with a lot of stuff, oh, you know, the last time I had bugs, they were fine, so uh, I'll try them this way too. So crickets, even relatively plain, taste good. Um, I'll hasten to point out that there is very little animal matter we don't season with at least something. So before you go off saying, oh yeah, you put salt and butter on anything and it tastes good, well yeah, we put salt and butter on you know, a lot of the flesh that we eat. So keep that in mind. So I do like crickets, they're tasty. There are some insects that are historically eaten raw and live, if you look at, around the world at cultures that eat insects regularly. This is me sampling some termites, which are pretty good, but my favorite thing to eat alive and raw is honeypot ants. And since I'm, I, I don't want to uh, run out of time, I'm going to quickly tell you that there are certain ants in which there is a cast or a set of workers that are fed sugary liquids, and their abdomens become huge repositories, balloons of sugary liquid. And if you're a sugar junkie, and I am, eating honeypot ants is really, really tasty. It's like having the syrup that you would put on a snow cone just without the ice. And then the last thing that I really like in terms of when I forage for stuff are dragonflies. Now I've got pictures here of leafcutter ants on the bottom on one side and cicadas on the top. And when these things are highly abundant, you can go out and catch them. Dragonflies, where I live in the swamps of uh, South Louisiana, well, I don't live in the swamps, but uh, uh, they're very, very common, which doesn't mean that they're easy to get. But when I fry a dragonfly and I put it on a little bit of mushroom with some Dijon soy butter, it is fantastic. And to a man and a woman, almost everyone who's ever tried them has liked them. One of the speakers earlier this morning did a TV show with me once, uh, Maria Mayor, and uh, <laughs> she actually had a little something poking on her uh, when she was chewing the dragonfly. And I said, well, that's not supposed to happen. So she didn't like my dragonflies. I reminded her of that this morning. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it does take a little sweat equity to go out and get dragonflies. So when I serve them, I kind of make a big deal out of the fact that, that I have uh, been, you know, running around uh, in the middle of the summer trying to make sure that you could have, you know, some tasty dragonflies. And as you saw in that last picture, those two people catching the dragonflies weren't me. And this is to remind me to thank all manner of people whom you all may never meet uh, who have helped me out uh, because this has been a fun, long adventure, uh, you know, 20 plus years now that I've been cooking bugs and it always helps uh, to have help. And, and so there's a lot of other people uh, that I owe thanks to. Now, uh, I wanna close uh, by just answering the basic question, why eat bugs? Because that's what comes at me a lot, you know, hey, why eat bugs? Well, I've already explained to you that they're nutritious. I hope that I have tried to demonstrate, at least in words and pictures, that if you cook them right, they are tasty. I've talked about the ecological reasons to do it. I've, I've told you that you probably do it inadvertently anyway. And I have failed to this point to mention that crustaceans, which are basically just bugs that live in the water, apparently are fine for us to eat, right? Lobster, crawfish, shrimp, crab, we eat those. And so all of this gets me to the most succinct answer, which is, why not eat bugs? There doesn't seem to be a good argument against it. So I'd like to put your mouth where my money is. I don't know how to turn that phrase. I'd like to put my money where my mouth is and offer at least a few of you, maybe up in the front, some chocolate syrup cookies, because I brought some, and some Southwest wax worms. So uh, I think that Annalise is going to help distribute. And if it's not a rush of people, I'll just say, how about you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you on the edge there, and uh, whoever's next to the lady in the red shirt raising your hand there, and how about you two guys right there in the front, and how about you, and how about that young lady in the red shirt who's stretching so hard her shoulder's gonna come out of her armpit, and while all this is going on, if you try to bug, can I just hear like, did you like it? Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I didn't fix that batch and I didn't want to have to fire the chef. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>